Yes, hi to everybody. Uh, do I start? Yes, uh, we have four papers and uh, four presenters, I suppose. Uh, yes, yeah, Sichuan has um, 20 minutes of presentation and then we have 10 minutes of discussion. So we let each presenter to present his, uh, his paper and at the end we get the questions. So uh, I start with the first one, uh, access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa, the regressive effect of tariff structures on urban and rural on grid households. So are you ready to start? Yes. Calimera Anastasiosa. Calimera, Calimera. <laughs> I, come, I come from Pyrgos, Peloponnese. So uh, when I see your chairman, Greek, Greek compatriot, so pleased to be here. Uh, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Halika. Halika, Jago. <laughs> so uh, I can start. You, you see my, my PowerPoint? Uh, not yet. I will start. Uh, I will check whether to uh, let me see. Um, can you just try again? I just change the setting so you can uh, share your screen. Uh, this is the presenter you're talking about. Yeah, yes. Yes. So, Alexia, are you sharing your screen right now? Um, because we can't see anything. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, sharing my screen. Um, you see? Y yes, now we do see. Okay. I start? Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, good uh, afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Alex Sivesa. I'm PhD in Energy Economics at Montpellier University. And uh, uh, this afternoon, I will present a paper co-written with my PhD uh, advisors, Mrs. Sandrine Michel, uh, on, uh, and its focus on access to electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. We want uh, to um, evaluate how electricity tariffs contribute to the difference between uh, urban and uh, rural access rates for sub-Saharan countries in this paper, because we consider the tariff structure are the major instrument of access. It was the interface between the electricity production condition, the end user and public energy policy. So before starting- I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Alexia, I have to interrupt you because uh, we can see your face, but you, we can't see your slides. Oh, okay. Um... So normally it's just uh, at the bottom of the screen, you have a, a share the screen, like with, a, with an arrow. Uh, uh, okay. Can you see it? Yes. And then you just uh, share, you, you click on it. And uh, yes, it, it was in French, it was called affichage intervenant. Uh, partager l'écran, and then uh, um, something like desktop, desktop uh, one, or uh, is that okay? It is a green, no. button, green button, green button, yes, yes, good, the only green one, good. Uh, green. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. So, um, uh, yes, so the objective of this paper is to uh, uh, evaluate how the electricity tariff structure contributes. Sorry, to... Alexis, sorry. <laughs> Could you just put diaporama and then, uh, lecture, you know, on, the, on top? F, F, F5? Uh, yes. Yes, it's good. That's it. It's good. Okay. <laughs> you can start. And uh, we, we tend to establish how electricity tariff stru uh, structure contribute to the difference between rural and urban access in sub-Saharan countries. 
So before starting the, pre the presentation, I would like to make uh, an analysis of the context surrounding the sub-Saharan continent in terms of access to electricity. All developing countries tend to reach the universal access rate by 2030. But for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it's very difficult to, to reach this objective. This continent uh, um, focus the major part of the no access to uh, electricity. Even so, sub-Saharan countries and, uh, has made undeniable progress in electricity access on average 9% per year, according to the International Energy Agency. But this progress face important constraints. The first one is demography. Indeed, population growth is more important than the progress in terms of access uh, to electricity registered in sub-Saharan Africa. The second re reason is linked to the great spatial heterogeneity between, between a urban and a rural access rates. Whereas the urban access rate is settled at 70%, rural access rate is settled at only 23%. And for a lot of countries, sub-Saharan countries, we have uh, access rates that are below 5%. So due to that context and relative to that context, how to fund, how to expand access in sub-Saharan African countries. So basically, the transitional scheme was cross-subsidization. It was a transfer, a, a transfer of a surplus from urban to rural households. But it was difficult and impossible to make at the scale of sub-Saharan continent. Why? Because of two reasons. First, the failures in terms of supply because we observed that in many uh, sub-Saharan countries, there is no, rea no reliable electricity supply to provide access to electricity for all the population. The second reason is mainly due to low-income countries. We have low-income countries and low urbanization rates, and we have insufficient critical, ma critical mass of users in order to finance or access to electricity. So, Considering the context, considering that access to urban and rural households uh, passed by the grid, and the fact that no access remain considerable, the question is that they solely related to the fact the location uh, of urban and rural customer. And we are assuming in this paper that pricing constitutes the major instrument in terms of electricity. How electricity tariff structure contribute to the difference between rural and urban access rate, and we call it in the paper the energy access gap. So that was for the research question. We see that in the context of progressive tariffs, sub-Saharan countries use mainly progressive pricing. There are consequences, adverse effects for residential sector. Indeed, the first point is that there is a, a very differences between countries and the high significant pricing difference. We have countries that use a 10, uh, 10 countries that use linear tariffs. We have countries that use three blocks or more. So it is very heterogeneous inside sub-Saharan Africa. The second point is the lifeline rates because in progressing prices, it's difficult to face to energy poverty, because we have an heterogeneous energy po poverty inside the sub-Saharan African countries. And this second point is very important because we use it as a me special metric further in uh, our presentation to treat our, de uh, our own database. The three point is the dilemma of progressive pricing, because for company, there is always a dilemma between uh, covering costs some companies judge that the costs are too high and the tariffs are too low in order to recover the capex and the opex costs. And we have the problem if we're raising the tariffs, the problem of acceptability for all people. The second point is we have regressive pricing for productive use. Indeed, 
some subsidies are allocated to uh, some industries, like, for example, for mining industries in sub-Saharan countries and by economic activity. So this point tackles the prob problem of the progressive price. So basically, we use the, uh, we uh, have uh, our databases and we have uh, developed a specific metric to show heterogeneous energy poverty in sub-Saharan countries by combining access rates with the energy poverty indicator. You see on the left side, you see on the vertical axis, you have electricity rates, and on the horizontal axis, you have energy poverty line defined uh, according to the International Energy Agency as 5% of household income dedicated to energy expense. You see, the vertical red axis, it was the energy poverty line. So you see 5%, the vertical axis. And it allowed me uh, to uh, separate our sample into four different groups. You understand well. The group one is high electrification rate and low energy poverty, whereas group four is the extreme high energy poverty and low electricity rates. So we used to treat this uh, database composed by uh, 33 sub-Saharan countries. We got the uh, 782 observations for the period 1980 to 2012. We have two dependent variables, urban access rate and rural access rate. And we have 17 explanatory variables dividing into three categories. First, residential tariff structures. This dimension, this category include connection fees, social tariffs, social brackets, and all you have to know about residential tariff structures. The second dimension, the second category is production types, because from 1945 to 1990, we have a monopoly in the electricity industry. And in 1990, there is a breakdown because we introduce which we call the independent power producer. So we have to analyze if independent power production and deregulation for foster access or not. And the third dimension is willingness for, to pay. It's very important for the low income canteen as well as the top income canteen because tarification uh, forgets uh, now uh, new uh, target population, and it was important to take into account this dimension. Data was said using four countries group based on access and share of electricity. And we use a, a dynamic panel model with random effects. We confirm a death choice by a Northman test, and we control the endogeneity, endogeneity of our model using three instrumental variables. So to present my results, I uh, divided the uh, results uh, into the uh, three different categories I identified on this slide, residential, non-residential, production time, and willingness to pay. For the first dimension, residential tariffs, we observed that for group one and group two, residential pricing plays its role in financing access. We observed for group one that access of rural households benefits for cross subsidization. And we uh, also showing efficiency on the world tariff structure uh, for group two. Not surprisingly, for the group three and the group four, residential pricing targets only some consumers by injuring rural consumers. The lifeline range, uh, the social tariff developed uh, for, uh, for rural households can, uh, um, can improve rural access, can uh, slightly um, um, can slightly um, uh, foster access to electricity uh, for uh, rural household, but it's not possible for group four, and the tariff structure affects negatively uh, the uh, access for rural households. For the second dimension, productive tariffs and access, 
We have the tariff structure for group one and group two that promotes the development of productive activities. So for group one, typically we have growth of urban industry and the transfer is realized from commercial activities. And we have uh, uh, both commerce and industry that are in favor in rural areas. In group two, we have a, a tarification that is in favor of industries because we have a, a group of countries like Zambia belongs to this uh, uh, group who are countries that depend in, uh, from extractive industries. So this result is basically uh, obtained by the fact that a lot of countries in this group depend on the extractive industries. Pricing remains unfavorable to all activities in rural for the group two. For tariff structure um, in uh, uh, for uh, for the group uh, um, for the group uh, um, three and four, we have obtained that uh, tariff structure favor industry with no consistent benefit to commercial activities for group three and uh, no uh, impact for group four, just one significant um, The more uh, important and uh, the, the interesting results is for the three dimension. The three dimension is production type and access. We obtained the uh, main results for all the group. We obtained the public utility ineffectiveness in serving both urban and rural constituents. And the deregulation introduced by independent producers uh, until uh, uh, since uh, 1990 does not counterbalance the ineffectiveness uh, except for the countries of Group 1. Because in Group 1, you find countries like Ghana or Ivory Coast who uh, deregulate their sector uh, since 1990. So you can see. Uh, just an impact to foster access, but in general, IPP does not foster access for all the group we analyze. Finally, for the final dimension, we have the analysis of low income countries. So typically residential tariffs for group one and group two correctly target low income revenues. We have positive willingness to pay in group one and is acting as a learning effect. And the most interesting result is for group two, we obtain a negative willingness to pay for the council number two. It means that we have in, uh, uh, the, in this group consumers who don't have the possibility to access to the social tariff because they are considered uh, the, the, their income are considered as too high and their uh, income is too low to uh, get self-sufficiency to have power. So they are trapped in a, a black hole in terms of access to electricity. And we call it as a black hole in terms of access to electricity. For group three and group four, we obtain that negative willingness to, to pay uh, uh, for the lowest canteen and the subsidized rates are powerless to trigger access. And it's uh, the same case for uh, the group four. And uh, the most interesting thing is that you can have a willingness to pay, but it's not supported by the tarification put in place by the electrical companies. So even if there is a, a willingness to pay, in low income groups, there is no tarification supporting those activities, those people who wanted to get access to electricity. For top income until, uh, uh, top income councils, we obtain a positive, positive willingness to pay for group one, households are able to get access to electricity. For group two, we obtain negative willingness to pay. It means that consumers on the top canteen attending from uh, uh, service quality improvements, reliable electricity supply. For the top canteens, for group three and uh, group four, we obtain a positive WT in urban areas, meaning uh, that the population have the ability to pay, but 
the tarification does not target those kind of population. So the population is clearly excluded by the on-grid network and the tarification put in place by electricity companies. So to conclude, we uh, analyze electricity tariffs and we prove that it fails to provide uh, reduced uh, rates uh, and uh, it's ineffective to address energy uh, poverty in both urban and rural households. The criterion of location is this important that the economic condition of the customers serve. We have people that are poor, that are considered too poor, but that they, have, uh, they have the willingness to pay but the tariff, the on-grid ne network, decided to ignore those populations. And focusing on access for the poorest reveal new targets, as I said before, completely ignored by current electricity tariffs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So let me... So is there any question for, for the presentation? Yes. So go on. I don't know who spoke. Mm, anyone? So we can't hear Anastasios, but maybe if there is no question for the moment, maybe we can uh, move on to the next uh, speaker. May Thank you very much for your, your very nice presentation, Alexis. Thank you very much. I hope a question I am attending. I was a little bit stressed, but uh, <laughs> I see uh, all people understand. Perhaps they feel me. It was research. too clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your intention. Uh, I'm. Uh, we can't hear you, Anastasios. Now, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, perfectly. Okay, so I was talking. <laughs> I thought that I was unmuted, but finally not. So I was making, I was asking questions, and I and I see that um, nobody could hear me. So I say thank you very much for the nice presentation. It was very informative. 
and uh, we got a lot of uh, insights, uh, especially for these countries uh, that um, it's difficult to find data. So I don't know in what in what way you found uh, so many data to make the analysis. And this I congratulate you because uh, it's the it's the major part of our work with my PhD advisor. We have to gather data from uh, activity reports for electricity company as well as the World Bank, uh, as the way as the World Bank, and it was especially difficult. And it was the main part of the job. Uh, the main part of the job is not to, to treat the model; it was to gather data. And uh, we have a, a long time period from 1990 to 2012. We we have uh, this uh, this kind. Uh, this kind of uh, data, so 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 it was the main part of the job. Uh, that's why I'm saying I go, uh, congratulate you because it's very really tough to get the data for these countries. Uh, so um, uh, what I see here is that um, uh, you analyze uh, the groups by taking as a given the tariff, the actual tariff structure, um, and. Um, uh, the result you get depends on the actual tariff structure, but these countries um, start thinking or start having some programs to change the actual tariff structure so that they can increase accessibility, urban and rural, rural as well. And also, uh, they get a lot of help from uh, international organizations to um, uh, use alternative technologies, especially renewables, uh, so that uh, they can uh, electrify, especially rural areas. And these places will have different tariff structures than the actual ones, which may favor more quickly the accessibility. But you don't take this into account, as I see, you take into account the existing tariff structure, so the results depend entirely on this current structure which is not very effective or very efficient yes yes anastasios i understand well and uh, this is because of this, my second paper of my phd treat deals uh, with uh, mini grid and off grid systems so uh, it, was, uh, it, it was it uh, was it was uh, we considered first that off-grid option and mini-grid option, decentralized option as, are the future for sub-Saharan countries. But if you see in the chart uh, from uh, the International Energy Agency, you see that 40% of the new connection passed by the on-grid. So perhaps there is a development of, uh, and uh, the development of access to electricity passed by this new decentralized option. But you have to consider one grid network. And one grid network, you have to analyze the major instrument of access, and it was the tariffs. So I don't treat mini grid and off grid because I uh, treated uh, previously on an article published in the Journal of Energy and Development. That's good, very good. Uh, as I see as well, second part of the question is that um, the uh, current tariff structure is based on uh, efficiency grounds, uh, but most countries, when they develop their um, electricity system, uh, prefer to have a tariff that represents the average cost and not the marginal cost, uh, so that uh, we use a lot of uh, cross subsidies to electrify the whole country. And in some countries, developed countries, still we have the same old system of tarification of tariffs. Um, and it worked fine because 99%, even more, 100% of people of the territory is electrified. Why we can't do the same thing in uh, sub Saharan Africa countries then? I think that uh, the, the problem of cost is very important. You have uh, always uh, uh, incremental costs, long marginal costs, and uh, all this cost I taking into consideration. But the fact is that we have electrical companies now that depending uh, on fuels, you know, 
they're depending on fuels. So they don't recover CAPEX costs. They have difficulty to recover OPEX costs and they have difficulty to recover CAPEX costs. So you're starting uh, on a situation that is different for other companies uh, around the world. You have companies that doesn't recover CAPEX and OPEX. And naturally they said, okay, tariffs are too low. So we have to raise it, but it, it was impossible. It was impossible to do that. They have costs like fuels. Many uh, countries depending on fuels, they change. Uh, they decided to change hydro by fuels, diesel uh, power plants, uh, fuel power plant, etc. But they don't cover the costs. So they wanted to raise tariffs, and the, popul the population said no. So I think that basically the problem is the development of the, elect the electricity company on the inside. And the fact that um, electricity company does not cover CAPEX and OPEX costs. First, you can introduce deregulation. You can introduce whatever you want. It's in ineffective because the problem is still there. So it's important uh, and uh, it was a uh, uh, um, specification for sub-Saharan countries to know less costs, to know that companies have difficulty to recover CAPEX costs, to recover OPEX costs, operation and maintenance costs. And it was uh, very difficult to understand and it, it was different from other countries. That's good. Uh, what about if we increase the number of years to uh, amortize the investments, uh, would be possible to have lower tariffs then so that the accessibility will increase? Uh, if we look at the short term, for sure, uh, in short term, <laughs> the tariffs do not cover the CAPEX and OPEX, but if we take a longer view, a long term view, then probably tariffs will be lower and in the long run we will cover these expenses. Um, um, perhaps, but according to a, a recent World Development Report, they said that 80% uh, of the companies, uh, uh, of the electricity companies in sub Saharan countries uh, tend to um, reach, tend to uh, cover OPEX cost, but they have difficulty to uh, uh, cover 30% of them cover capex costs so you see if you're taking it was a survey realized by the world bank in 2017 2017 i think it was a recent survey and the situation is still the same yeah um, i will end with uh, the last comment and um, this is true what they were saying because uh, their commercial losses their technical losses and um, that's why they, uh, you mentioned the figures you mentioned before, they cannot really uh, cover even the um, OPEX expense, or at least a small part. But if there are improvements in technical losses and commercial losses, then they will be able to cover at least the uh, OPEX expenses even more than that so we need to start with uh, uh, more efficiency at other levels so that we'll be able eventually to fix prices at a reasonable level because we can uh, actually recuperate this cost through a more efficient way of functioning um the electricity uh, public companies so probably we have to look at other aspects aspects uh, before we condemn completely the tariff the actual tariff structure would yes. improve in other fields as well I, I i understand the progress in terms of uh, electricity but uh, let me take uh, an example of for example a group one which was uh, the group uh, that have uh, high electricity rates and uh, low energy poverty. I, uh, uh, in this group, uh, there is the example of Ghana. Ghana is quoted as uh, uh, one country that uh, is, uh, is at the top and can uh, reach the universal access to electricity. But 
uh, you can say, okay, Ghana has made a significant progress in terms of network investment and etc. But the problem is that the whole structure, we introduce deregulation, we introduce a dependency, and now Ghana, the government of Ghana, are dependent from private investors. So even if you have improvements in terms of network, even if if uh, you said, OK, I can improve tariff structure by uh, uh, reducing a, a loss in terms of network, it doesn't matter. You have the whole structure and you introduce deregulation and now independent po power production making a pressure from the government and the government are under pressure and uh, uh, their threats. Uh, Ghanaian government uh, and they are don't uh, uh, there is a problem of payments there is a problem of dependence from EPPs independent power production they represent the major part of the electricity produced and now there is a problem because we have the wall structure we introduce the regulation and the, the wall structure is in effectiveness so one grid network if we still uh, still develop this kind of structure, liberaliz liberalization, EPPs concentrated in a urban areas, we always get ineffectiveness. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much, Alexis. It was really kind of you to have all this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, I hope City, City Pass will win Roland Garros yeah. if you like tennis. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so now we thank move you very to, much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, now we move to the next speaker. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out who is the next one because I don't see the. Um, let me see. Uh, Gabriel, it's you, the next yes. one. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's good. Can you see my slides? Yes, I do see. So the same applies to you, 20 minutes for presentation, 10 minutes for discussion. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Gabriel Anandaraja from UCL Energy Institute, uh, University College uh, London. Uh, I'm going to talk about improving energy system and energy access in Ethiopia, uh, uh, an inclusive approach. This is a uh, uh, presentation from an ongoing research project funded by UK government, uh, Foreign and Co Commonwealth Office uh, under its uh, energy economic growth program. So in this presentation, I, I uh, following this introduction, then uh, I will have uh, slides to talk about methodology. Then as part of this, we did some energy demand projection and also some defined uh, qualitative uh, energy transition pathways. I will show and discuss about it. Then I will also show some results on energy system transition pathways followed by conclusion. Uh, in this presentation, I want to talk more on the uh, process that we used in this inclusive approach than, uh, than showing the results mostly. So uh, when it comes to Ethiopia, as you have seen and you know clearly from Alex's presentation, the electricity access rate is really low in African country and Ethiopia is not uh, different to that. And it is one of the, you know, the least developed as well as least electrified countries in, in the world uh, with only 44% access. And as Alexa said, the rural areas are actually the worst, actually, you know, only 27% of rural households have access to grid electricity. And it is one of the, uh, the, the highest electricity access deficit in, in Africa. Uh, I think uh, uh, the previous presentation well found, uh, you know, presented on this access rate in many countries in Africa. But uh, uh, however, this Ethiopian government has a very ambitious and challenging plan actually to make this country middle income by 2025 with a, uh, with a plan to actually, you know, it says uh, with no increase in GH emission under its uh, second growth and transformation plan. But in order to increase its economic growth uh, as, as uh, you know, it is important also that uh, electricity access should be in increased and therefore they have another very challenging national electrification program which actually said that uh, 
uh, achieving uh, universal access to electricity by 2025. In this case, the, the, the target is met to uh, 65% uh, by connecting to national grid and the 30% of the household will be connected or served with, uh, served with off-grid technologies. Uh, but uh, as you know, this is uh, really challenging, where, you know, based on where the country is now and also the impact of COVID in, in all countries. So this research actually uh, tried to develop a few, few possible transition pathways to modern energy in Ethiopia, uh, so specifically, you know, trying to use an inclusive approach, incorporating behavioral issues and social science into an energy system model. So the main problem in developing countries, if you see most of the time this Western world uh, or developed country researchers develop energy models, then also provide, prepare some reports to the country. And we find that uh, these models may not be kind of very suitable to use or to save the local needs. So how to make this model policy relevant? That's the main objective here in this uh, research project. So unlocking barriers in energy system planning process and policy analysis by developing energy system model that adopt an inclusive approach through stakeholder engagement. In this slide, if you see the, the right hand side in longer term, like in 10 year period or something, what we want is to achieve a reduced poverty level. Uh, then in order to achieve uh, uh, and you know to mitigate uh, uh, alleviate poverty, electricity access is important. This is not the only factor, but it is one of the important factors as well. There are several other factors, but in order to save electricity or access, then we need a robust energy planning and policy, and we need a right tool to develop it. And also then the capacity at the policy makers and the researchers in local level should be enhanced. So that's what we are trying to do here. So if you see in the middle, then the output is tools and transition report and pathways, policy briefs, databases, etc. So that it can help them to do, you know, to develop a long-term policy scenarios. But if you start from the left side, uh, as we don't have much information on uh, developing country energy system, we had to collect a lot of data from this. So on the bottom left, uh, if you see, you start with the demand, what are the drivers, what could be the future growth rate in try to project is. Then on the top, we see that uh, some pathways for the capacity and resource expansion. Then we need to discuss with the local stakeholders to understand possible qualitative transition pathways and and also these capacity development pathways. They need to think about as their grid network is very limited, how we want to actually meet this target with a off-grid to home grid, then we used an on-set model there. Then once we know what type of grid supply, then we need to also look at this. The middle one is the energy system planning model to understand you know, what it should be the optimal generation and capacity mix. So then we, we have these two different models. Actually, the information is uh, from onset and OSIMOS is iterative, actually. Onset uh, decide based on levelized cost of electricity, whether to connect to off-grid or supply with, uh, with uh, uh, on, sorry, whether to connect on-grid or supply with off-grid. Then uh, energy system model actually come up with calculate the generation mix and optimal cost. Then actually it is fed back to on set model, then there are some iterative process and let's find a, find a solution. So uh, during this process, uh, then we carried out a stakeholder workshop, interviews, then uh, uh, also presented to policymakers with our model, early results to get some feedback so that we can actually develop the model that uh, needs the, uh, uh, that actually can save the local needs and uh, put it in the policy process. Then we also already tra pro delivered few trainings and uh, we are going to develop a, a, a provide a long week training on these develop tools. The overall aim is to, to make sure that uh, policymakers will have access to this tool and also have capacity to use it. So how, in order to understand this energy service demand and drivers, we conducted a small expert interviews using expert elicitation method. This is mainly to understand 
what are the main drivers in the uh, to project energy service and what would be the potential values for them and you know growth rate etc and also the potential technologies in the demand side would be available especially on, on, the, on the residential sector and this information will be actually influenced to calculate this uh, tier consumption level and how in the future different household will move to different uh, tier level then the LIB model was used actually to project energy service demand, which was actually given then to the onset model to identify how this uh, connection should be. Uh, you know, this is not, you know, very great work or something. We covered a lot of areas, a lot of experts or something, but rather than, you know, not knowing where the data coming from, we tried to actually generate data from, from the local experts. So this is a, a, a one slide showing uh, some results on these interviews uh, and also a summary. You can see in the uh, bottom left, like uh, what uh, expert things are the main drivers could be for the demand projection. It says the GDP growth, population, then urbanization. These could be the main drivers. On the right side also, you can see it depends on the, on the technology or appliance side. They say income could play a major role or it could be awareness about the appliance, so family size, availability of appliance, or can actually play a role. On summaries, it says like in longer term, 2050, 2060, as these models are long-term projection or planning one, GDP growth could be about 5%, and the population growth in 2050, 2060 could be 1.8%. And the rate of urbanization is, uh, is around uh, 45%. So these are not uh, kind of used or using any estimate or using any regression or econometric models. These are coming from the expert elicitation process, what experts think about the future in Ethiopia. So in order to understand on the supply side pathways, so we conducted, uh, uh, we organized a stakeholder engagement or interaction workshop where, where we invited local policymakers, researchers, development organization, private sector people. It was a one day workshop to understand what are the future potential pathways for development. In this case, uh, the morning was mainly talking about the project and needs, what we are trying to find out. Then uh, in the afternoon, they come up with these pathways, the business as usual, that is all these committed uh, plan funded projects going ahead. Then high ambitious, we are actually, the, the energy demand uh, will exponentially grow, Ethiopia outperforms. Then ambitious is sim similar to high ambitious, but uh, there's some delay in the early period, so delayed start. The big businesses, uh, so the focus is mainly on the development of industry and big businesses, not on the new connection to the unelectrified household. Slowdown is, you know, everything is delayed from the business as usual scenarios. So using those information, then uh, this energy system models actually developed five different scenarios. You can see the summary on total uh, electricity demand, high and low. On the second slide, you can see how this uh, tire level actually changes across the uh, scenarios in, in, in the low demand cases, many households still will be in 2030 under tier one, or otherwise it will be moved to other tiers. Mm -hmm. So and several other uh, things, for example, universal access to electricity, which is the government targets, but that is also delayed under slowdown and big business scenarios. The big business scenarios mainly focus on development of industries and big businesses, not on the on the unelectrified householders. So this is an example of different tier levels for under new policy scenarios. This is the one actually defined as a business as usual scenarios in, uh, in the workshop. So you can see clearly on the long term, many households from tier one actually move to tier two and three and four, et cetera. But it's also changes across the scenarios based on the assumptions. So you can clearly see the, the demand growth here uh, what's you, what you see here in these continuous lines, normally the higher demands one, include demand for electricity from uh, industry, commercial, agriculture, buildings, et cetera, and also residential sector uh, stores who have already access to electricity or connected to the grid. Then all these uh, dash or dots lines are the household which, have, which are unelectrified now, 
and will be uh, connected later how the R demand is uh, growing. As you can see here, they are, they are the, this unelectrified household demand is really, re really small. Uh, you know, they compare to the uh, rest of the demand, uh, including the, the household which are already connected. So these were the demand the models are trying to meet and also these onset models, what, what is tried to do is, uh, is uh, to see how this uh, demand could be met either on, uh, by the grid or off grid technology. But uh, then osmosis model tried to see whether, whether the demand would be actually, uh, what could be the optimal uh, generation and technology mix to save this demand. So these are, I have only three slides on the, on the results. Uh, this shows actually the onset model, which actually try to find how this demand could be met, either uh, grid supply or grid supply. Uh, it's a very special model. You can see this, uh, most of this unelectrified household, it says in early period, actually it is optimal or cost effective to collect them as a as an off-grid technologies, especially on the standalone PV in most of the cases and in few cases it's a, a PV mini grid. Uh, and also it's a, a share is I think in the national electrification program, it, it was talking about by 2025 meeting uh, um, uh, 65% of the household will be connected to national grid and 35% to off grid. But in this case, it goes even some cases, more than 40% actually connected to off grid. In a technology split, if you see 2030 and 2065, what should be the capacity addition in uh, different scenarios? You can see this in the graph, the top four one is uh, 2030. Uh, if you if you see this, uh, it's it's mainly met 2030 demand is uh, met by hydro. The blue one is hydro. Uh, the high, as you know, Ethiopia is actually blessed with hydro and it has a, a lot of uh, resources available. So they need to actually use hydro to meet the near term demand. But they, you can still see some uh, solar and wind. But these are part of the scenario assumptions coming from the from the workshop. Where the experts thought that it could be, you know, uh, there could be some development under different high ambitions and business, you know, big business scenarios on uh, on wind and solar. But if you see 2065, uh, the all available kind of resources have been utilized or invested in hydro. Then it moves to solar mainly, then also uh, or biomass in the high ambitious scenario when the demand is really high, then a small amount of nuclear. And also as we go to these uh, highly intermittent resources and uh, then uh, you need a backup capacity, which is coming from gas turbine. And also a small amount of nuclear investment, actually. The government also is really interested on the nuclear and exploring the possibilities and potential to invest there. So this is the last slides of the results. Uh, if you see, uh, and all scenarios, what happened to the different technologies, actually, in 2030 and 2065? Uh, as uh, there's a huge difference in demands in the scenarios. Uh, for the hydro, you, you can see huge variation. It means when the demand is high and high, then it actually opt to invest in hydro. But in 2065, all these marginal demands, so additional demands actually coming or uh, met by mainly solar, then also with, uh, with the biomass. A uh, huge range actually, if you see 2030, the hydro expansion could be 12 to 45 gigawatts. Currently, a, you know, less than five gigawatts of uh, hydro actually installed in, in Ethiopia. On conclusion, uh, this research developed for transition pathways to modern energy in Ethiopia, uh, used an inclusive approach. If you see this Ethiopia's ambitious electrification target can be achieved at a lower cost with a greater role for off-grid technologies. I think it is in line with the, uh, with the government plan, but uh, our, our research suggests even it can go further than 65, uh, sorry, 35% on off-grid connection. And aside from hydro, 
there are significant roles for solar, wind, geothermal as well, and natural gas come as a backup technology in many uh, scenarios, expansion scenarios. And uh, I forgot to say in the scenario definition, uh, uh, Ethiopia also in some scenarios can come as a, as a become a hub for electricity trade. In this case, huge amount of hydro and this renewable electricity could be exported, which can actually bring down like 30% of the revenue could be equal to 30% of the electricity you know, system cost. And uh, there's also a bit uncertainty on this large expansion of hydropower as you know, due to climate change uncertainty, which can actually affect uh, the effect of precipitation and then water inflow for hydropower. There could be seasonal and monthly variation. This case also has some uncertainties on this. So besides that, we also did a large scale questionnaire survey. This is yet to do. So we did some analysis on this. This I, I summarize here. So what we are going to do next is, all these five scenarios are going to, we are going to add this behavior side specifically on how energy efficiency improvement can actually reduce energy demand for household, then would it have some impact on the, you know, capacity mix, technology mix, what we, we have shown here. You know, that is the next step or currently that what we are doing. And, uh, you know, this is the acknowledgement and project partner, that's it. And um, uh, thank you and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, this was a very interesting presentation and it was uh, related to the previous one uh, with a new different methodology actually and different data in a different country. Uh, the issues are uh, always the same. Here we don't talk about tariffs, but implicitly tariffs play a role as well in um, modernizing the um, Ethiopian electricity system. Uh, so we'll take a few questions before we move to the next presenter. Uh, uh, are there any questions for Gabriel? Um, I don't see, uh, let me check again. Um, you can ask question through the chat or directly to Gabriel. You can address the questions. Um, so I don't see any questions. So let me ask you one question only uh, before we move to the next presenter. Uh, so you mentioned different um, uh, actually the research you made was um, to interview the experts. Uh, how do they see the transition? And uh, you stressed mostly the technologies to be used in the future for the transition, but not, uh, I didn't see actually uh, how you incorporate as well uh, the social aspects and uh, the local um, business environment, uh, because uh, we know that um, in these countries, uh, there's a big difference in approaching businesses compared to developed countries, and they have valuable experiences in administering, administrating uh, the electricity systems uh, with local values. Uh, so does, does it play a role in the development and the transition as well, or you take just the technical part, the technology part, uh, and you consider only the new technologies with the traditional ones to make the transition to uh, of the, of the Ethiopian electricity system? So the social aspects, how can we uh, find them and how can we integrate with the new technologies? Yeah, okay, I think that's a great question, actually. That is a big issue also in uh, when it comes to energy system models and developing transition pathways, 
how we can actually incorporate a local aspect, especially the social aspect, and also how we can represent this uh, business as an uh, aspiration and energy aspiration, etc. So that is, uh, we did it in two different ways. One is the reason we did not project or make assumptions on what could be the growth rate or what could be the projection, what could be the variable. We did a bit of literature review on this, how in developing countries the GDP happen or GDP growth rate happen or all these parameters. And uh, what is what we have seen in the past in Ethiopia, based on that, then we developed these interview questions. Then we discussed with a, with a local expert and asked based on local condition, local social condition, social aspect, how do you see then, uh, you know, when, the, when they respond, they also included like potential future migration or, or people from other countries to Ethiopia as well, you know, when they're thinking about future population growth, it's not only the, the birth, uh, you know, in country birth or something. Then on the second one is when we discuss these um, quality scenarios or transition pathways, then in this uh, actually the scenario come with these big businesses. Then this, so that is where this the expert thought in the in the workshop, uh, because the the expert represented from policymakers uh, different ministries as well. It's not one ministry or something. Then uh, researchers, uh, development organization, including you know. Uh, UN organization, World Bank, then the International Resource Institute. So many, many, many representatives there. Are. So no, then uh, including private sector, some uh, companies. Then they saw, they thought uh, these businesses could actually boom and develop a future. Uh, uh, you know, that is this uh, industrial partnering and development, bringing bring big businesses to the earth. That is why one aspect of the development, we develop these uh, big business scenarios. So like that, uh, you know, to a certain extent, we captured in the, in the stakeholder interaction and uh, interviews this one, try to then translate into modeling form. But honestly speaking, no energy system model actually can actually fully capture this type of social aspect is still to certain extents in different ways, people are trying to, or energy modelers are trying to capture it. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. If there are no questions, uh, then we're going to move to the next presenter. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, perhaps uh, one, one question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, uh, thank you for this presentation. I, I just, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I worked uh, on East Africa. And I, I, have, have you just compared your results uh, obtained in Ethiopia with other countries? I, uh, I think about Kenya, because in Kenya, there is a, a lot uh, of progress in terms of, uh, of uh, access to electricity. Uh, they're developing a solar industry. And uh, I wanted to know if uh, you compared uh, uh, your results to another country, uh, another country belongs to East Africa. Uh, no, we, we haven't. In this project, we particularly focus on Ethiopia and we try to work with the Ethiopian government or policymakers to make sure we develop a model for Ethiopia and can do some analysis then uh, you know, develop capacity there so that they can use it. But uh, other researchers in UCL actually work even with uh, Rwanda, especially on so solar home system. They work at a micro level on uh, rural areas with uh, particular villages or few villages on how, how these uh, residential or consumers or household uh, uh, you know, behave specifically on social and behavior aspects of using social home, solar home system. They try to understand, you know, how the electricity is used, when they are used, for what purpose they are using it. So there are some some researchers are doing very micro level, but very detailed and in depth study as well on rural areas. But uh, in this particular project, we 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 we. we we, we have no plan to compare it with uh, neighboring countries. Yeah. And just perhaps another question. Uh, I uh, read in, in, in current truth that there is a clash between Egypt, Egypt and Ethiopia, Ethiopia uh, for the development of hydro, the 
development uh, he, he drew. Can you speak about that uh, that geopolitical clash? Uh, it impedes uh, the development of uh, he drew in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, do you think that uh, this is a real big deal or not? Yeah, this is also a, a really a sense, sensitive issue when, you know, it's a, it's a highly sensitive issue. I think at the beginning when we make assumptions on the model and in different scenarios on these hydro projects, then we, we discussed and we made certain assumptions on whether this plan will be, plants will be in operation, when, and so under different scenarios, we made some assumptions. Uh, as we work also with uh, the, the policy makers and try to do something here, we, we, we don't normally explicitly talk few of these uh, political issues in, in this, you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alexi, for the question and Gabriel for the answer. Uh, this was the last question because we have to move to the next presenter. And so uh, the next one is uh, Yilun Liu. Yep. Uh, yes. That's good. The floor is yours. Great. Great. Uh, can you hear me clearly and see my screen? Uh, yes, both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi everyone. I am uh, Yidun Luo from uh, Kyoto University and uh, currently a PhD student. So today's my presentation is uh, a study on the linkage between the capacity pricing and the carbon pricing in the electricity market. So uh, currently the electricity system is uh, facing the transition problem as a complex system. And especially in the liberalized electricity market, uh, in order to achieve a multiple goal in the future, uh, the market-based policy need to be designed and thereby a single electricity price in the liberalized market is not enough in order, since we want to achieve many goals in the future. And uh, when the multiple policy are acting on the, on the electricity system at the same time, it is important to understand what is the interaction among all those policies. So uh, the previous study has uh, investigated uh, the barrier and the misalignment of the interaction among the electricity market quantitatively, and as well as there are many quantitative modeling to simulate and analyze the VRE incentive, uh, the interaction between the VRE incentive and the carbon pricing and the VRE incentive with the capacity pricing. So some of the study noticed that uh, uh, the, there is an unclear interaction between the capacity pricing and the carbon pricing. So here, this study is basically focusing on to contribute a better understanding of the framework design of the pricing mechanism, considering the reliability and the decarbonization during this transition period. So here, we choose the capacity mechanism and the emission trading mechanism as an example of, uh, of the market-based policies for the reliability and the decarbonization. So the question addressed in this study is uh, what is the interaction between the capacity pricing and the carbon pricing and how this interaction ultimately affect the trajectory of the power mix change and here we have the hypothesis is uh, this interaction may cause an unexpected side effect. So in order to answer these questions, uh, we developed a, a semi-quantitative dynamic simulation model based on the system dynamics method. And here is a causality diagram of the model. And we have the five module in this model, the capacity changing module where to calculate uh, uh, to simulate the installed capacity and the capacity price module for the for capacity pricing and the carbon pricing module here for the carbon price and the electricity module to simulate electricity price changing as well as the investment decision, decision model. So in since we are considering the liberalized market, so all the decision in the liberalized market was made as a pure a business, business behavior uh, decision. So it's just depends on how the profits uh, could, uh, could it reach the expected return or not. So first is the capacity changing module. So here we have the three representative technology. The wind is for the VRE, which is a flat to the output. 
and the call for the stable fossil fuel, stable output fossil fuel, and the liquid natural gas for the flexible fossil fuel power plants. And uh, this diagram is the so-called uh, stake and the stock and the floor diagram for the system dynamic method. So basically, the invest the new investment new investment will be the the floor into the stock stock of the in installed capacity. And in the meantime, there will be the decommission and the retirement from uh, from this uh, stock. And so it's a it's a dynamic model. So the time step in this model is counted by weeks. And uh, uh, when the weeks accumulate to the years, since the investment and decommission or retirement are all counts by the, uh, the decision was made by the end of the year. So if we transfer this uh, stock and the flock diagram into the mathematical uh, equations, uh, then there will be the, the current capacity will equal to the initial capacity uh, plus the, the, cal the calculus uh, of uh, new investment minus the decommission minus the retirement. So for the supply demand balance here, we modeled the, the VRE electricity was equal to the improvement of, uh, uh, to the input of capacity factor times with the existing capacity for the VRE. And for the core electricity generation is the core capacity times with the operating factor, which is a stable, is a, is a constant line. And for the electricity consumption, uh, we modeled as an uh, input from uh, a weekly demand for one year. And uh, then the, the residual load here equal to the demand minus the wind minus the core generation. So the LNG electricity was, was built as uh, flexible resources. So it, it, it uh, needed to meet the, the residual load. And uh, for this uh, electricity price module, uh, basically it's built, it depends on, uh, built on the Based on the concept of the merit order pricing, pricing concept, uh, the the marginal cost is equal to the carbon price plus the the marginal fuel cost, and when the system is uh, is is loose, which means the supply is uh, is is larger than the demand, then the electricity price was calculated as the highest marginal cost as well as the weighted average marginal cost depends on whether the flexible plants works or not. And uh, when the capacity, uh, when the balance is tight, let's, let's say the demand is less than, uh, the supply is less than the demand, then the electricity price will go spike. And for the carbon price here, we modeled as a typical uh, cap and trade model. So if the emission, yearly emission is lower than the cap, then there'll be the floor price, the carbon price will be floor price. And if the emission is higher than the cap, uh, then the price will be the flow price plus the extra price. And we assume the emission cap from uh, 20, 2019 until 2050 will be just a straight line to become the zero emissions. Um, for the capacity price here, uh, we assume the capacity requirement is 15% uh, higher than the yearly peak load. And if the, if the installed capacity, capacity is uh, lower than the requirement, then the capacity price will become the maximum price. And uh, as long as the, the installed capacity gets uh, over to the requirement, then the capacity price will gradually decrease to the zero price. So uh, here is a decision-making module. Uh, basically, we have three technologies here. So for the income of wind, uh, is the basically the, the the FIT for selling electricity, and also the subsidy of income from uh, the emission allowance auctions, and the cost is fixed cost for the coal and uh, LNG. It's uh, electricity price for selling electricity and the capacity price, and the cost is fixed and the variable cost. So by calculating all this cost and compare it with uh, yearly revenue. If, uh, if the, the profit is higher than the expected uh, return, then there will be the new investment for a certain technology. If uh, the, the, the profit is lower than expected return, then the decision maker will decide to commission, uh, decommission the, 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 the power plant. 
So uh, there are five scenarios in our study. The first is the base scenario, basically the energy only market, no carbon price, no capacity price, and as well as the as the carbon scenario, we assume the thirty dollars per ton CO two flow price, and for the capacity scenario, there is no carbon pricing, and all the fossil fuel power plant will receive the capacity at price since uh, uh, since the since the, the variable renewable energy already have the uh, subsidy, subsidy from the feed-in tariff, so we'll, the capacity price will only pay to the fossil fuel. And for the interaction scenario, there will be the carbon price and uh, as well as the capacity price. And here, the last one is advanced scenario. We assume there are much higher floor price, carbon price, and with the uh, capacity price focusing on the flexible power plants, which is uh, the, the liquid natural gas power plant. So here we can see, we assume the worst scenario should be the interaction scenario. And the, the, the solution we would propose to, to, to deal with the worst case would be the uh, advanced scenario. So all the input of this study was the, from the real data, uh, real demand data and the wind power output and the CO2 emission of uh, Hokkaido which is a large, large, big island in Japan in, in, in 2019. And all the other parameters were based on the of, official statistic and the report and also uh, assumptions. So uh, if we went to the uh, result, first is the, the simulation result of the coal power plants capacity. So clearly we can see, if we see the green line here, uh, the capacity scenario ob obviously have the highest uh, call capacity among all the scenario. And uh, if we see these three lines below, the carbon price promotes the decommission of the coal power plant. And especially for the advanced scenario, it, uh, it, it decomm decommission all the coal power plant quite earlier. And then if we compare the interaction scenario with the carbon price, with the carbon scenario, it clearly shows the payment of, from a capacity price slowed down the, the coal decommission effort from the, carb, uh, from the carbon price. Since the interaction scenario and the carbon scenario both have the same floor price carbon, but uh, uh, there will be an extra capacity payment in the interaction, interaction scenario. So the next uh, result is, uh, is the LNG power plant's capacity. And so if we see the orange line and the yellow lines here, which is the two scenario doesn't have the capacity price, it's clearly we can see a, a typical boom and a bust uh, cycle of the investment. So uh, for these two doesn't have capacity price, we can see uh, it, it's unstable. And for the other of the uh, scenario, it shows a more relatively stable investment. So the capacity price could curve the investment uh, fluctuation. And uh, one more thing is here, we see the green line, which is the capacity scenario, actually gets the lowest uh, investment into the LNG power plant. So the reason here is uh, both LNG and the coal power plant receive the, the capacity payment, but uh, the coal power plant have this much has a stable output. So it's uh, the more coal power plants stay in the system will will squeeze out the flexible uh, LNG power plant, and uh, so that's why we see the the LNG is less is benefits less from the capacity payment. And uh, if we compare the, the advanced scenario with the interna interaction scenario, we can see the if the carbon price is not high enough to distinguish the coal and the LNG, uh, then the then it, it won't help the, the system to, to maintain maintain the, the high flexible resources. Uh, so the reason is uh, if we if we see the coal and LNG in the merit order merit order uh, electricity price uh, system, uh, the, 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 the carbon price, if it's not high enough to, to fill the gap, the emission gap between coal and LNG. So the, the order of the coal and LNG in the, in the merit order doesn't change. So it needs to be high enough to, to distinguish these two resources.
And the next result is the wind capacity changing. And for the, for the base scenario and the capacity scenario, which doesn't have the carbon price, it could uh, reach, a, reach a similar level of the fossil fuel, like around uh, 3,000 to 4,000 megawatts here. And for those three scenario have the carbon price, uh, they have the, the much, rev, much more revenue from the emission along those options. And especially for the advanced scenario, we can see here, the very high floor price could, uh, could uh, increase the wind capacity rapidly in the earlier stage. And one more interesting thing here is uh, if we focusing on the, on the end period of the simulation, uh, end time of the simulation period, we can see the interaction scenario actually get a, a little bit higher of the, of the wind capacity than the advanced scenario. The reason is there'll be more coal power plant existing in the interaction scenario. So the more coal power plants get uh, more emission and the more emission brings more revenue for the wind power. That, that leads to the, to, the, to, the, to the more wind, wind power in the interaction scenario. And the, the next result is the CO2 emission changing. And clearly we can see the capacity scenarios leads to the most, the highest CO2 emission, even higher than the base scenario, basically no reduction during the period. And uh, the interesting here is if we, if we recall the last uh, slides, which the interaction scenario got the most, uh, most VRE, but uh, uh, even though the, the CO2 emission doesn't reduce a lot. So again, the reason here is uh, regardless of the highest VRE in the system, there's still a lot of core power plant working in the, in the inter, interaction scenario. So uh, the core will keep emit CO2. And for the advanced scenario, we can see if we set the high floor price together with a flexible focusing capacity, then it's clearly uh, gets a, a very, uh, the consistent uh, incentive effect will works to reduce a lot of CO2. And here is the last uh, result, uh, which is the electricity price changing. So for most of the time, we can see the electricity price keep uh, around the 60 to $90 per megawatt hour. And uh, the capacity uh, the carbon price will clearly increase the electricity price. And uh, especially in around the end of the simulation period, the cap of the CO2 emission is basically near zero. Um, and if we see the green, green dot and the orange dot, we can see the capacity price actually helped uh, to uh, reduce the number of electricity, electricity price specs. And, but unfortunately, if we look in uh, closer to the interaction, interaction scenario, there will be much more price spec happens. Uh, again, the similar reason, there will be coal power plants in the, in the interaction scenario. And uh, when, well, as uh, it's also, there'll be coal in the capacity scenario, but in the interaction scenario, there'll be more wind, the VRE introduced to the system. So in the, in the end of the period, the, the coal doesn't have the ability to change the output and keep the system, the supply demand balance. So the price of the electricity will spike. And if we take another look for the advanced scenario, which is a blue dot here, um, clearly we can see even with a higher carbon price, still the electricity price is, is keeping in the relatively stable level and it doesn't spike a lot. So the last day is the conclusion of this study. So basically study investigate the interaction between the carbon price and the capacity price. So here we are going to see that although the carbon price and the capacity price are functioning very well individually, but together, uh, the advantage of these two mechanisms will be offsite. As put it in a simple way, the capacity price not only affects the system reliability, but also the CO2 emissions. And also for the carbon price is not only affected the CO2 emissions, but also will affect on the system reliability. So if we, if we could design this two mechanism, considering all those side effects, then 
we think it would uh, achieve the consistent uh, uh, incentives, thereby to achieve a better goal of the system transition. Thank you. This is all for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, um, Yilun, for this nice presentation. Uh, we see that uh, this is a very interesting topic uh, because it shows the trade-off that exists between uh, carbon pricing and um, uh, the carbon pricing and the effects may have on CO2 and system reliability. And these are very extremely important, uh, actually, uh, issues in the current market, the liberalized market. Um, uh, so uh, a lot of research is needed. And I think that uh, Yilun's contribution is great in this field. And it's really appreciated because we don't know all these uh, um, uh, uh, interactions very well yet. And it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, work to be done in this area. Uh, so I invite you to ask questions if you have. Um, so uh, let me see uh, the floor. Uh, as I mentioned, you can either ask the questions through the chat or directly. Uh, as I see, I don't see any hands raised at all. Um, is there any other reaction? No, I don't see the chat either. Uh, so there are no any questions as I see um, for Yilun. Mm? No? Okay. Uh, then if there are no questions, uh, probably it is due to the fact that uh, uh, it's a very rich presentation and with a lot of details and uh, people need to read a bit more the article. So we'd be very delighted to read more about these issues. Um, so uh, uh, we can move to the next um, uh, speaker, uh, the, the last one. Uh, so thank you, Yilun. Right. And yeah. at the end, uh, uh, we'll see with, uh, if somebody has uh, questions, then for sure, We'll take the question if we have more time. So the next, the last speaker is Dilip, I suppose. Thank you, Anastasis. Yes, this is Dilip. Yes. Let me uh, present my slides. Can you see my slides now? Uh, not yet. I see you. Ah, okay, that's good. Great, great. Yes, it works. Yes, good morning and good evening, everyone, whichever part of the world you are in. It's so nice to be with you all. And, and, and uh, till now, a good presentation has been made, and I've learned so many things, specifically from Yilun's presentation. And I will take it up from there uh, and, 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 and basically focus on capacity market design. So my question was, how, effectively, uh, how effective are the capacity mechanism design in enhancing the security of electricity supplies in Europe and in USA? And uh, it is a basically a lesson learned uh, uh, project. And uh, I, I kind of focused on this topic, thinking that um, knowing that very well, that there may not, might not be data which will enable me to kind of run through uh, econometrics analysis. So what I did was I, I went through, just a second, let me click on my slides. Yep, uh, so what I do, did was I did a comparative analysis so I will follow in this presentation what led me to um, do, do this research and what are the key literature, what is the methodology and, and data analysis. And I will present uh, discussions, key discussions around the capacity market design and present some conclusions and limitations. The motivation for introduction of capacity market was definitely one of the blackouts that we observed both in North America and Italy in, in 1996, 2003 and around 2006 in Europe as well. Uh, but majorly it is driven by the policy shifts. Around 1990, we, we know for sure that uh, uh, liberalization was introduced, the sectors were unbundled and, 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 and uh, competition was introduced uh, to bring in economic efficiencies into the sector. But policy priorities shifted in 2000 and uh, uh, countries started focusing on developing 
on new and renewable energies. In UK, Climate Change Act was introduced in 2008, which uh, uh, initially targeted reduction of 80% of emissions by 2050, but by 2019, they changed the act to now uh, achieve net zero by 2050. So what this led to policymaker to think is that uh, since uh, there is uh, not enough money because of, of the competition in the market and the price cap which have been put and, and the new and renewable energy might be intermittent. So they started implementing this capacity market reforms. So this capacity market reform actually sits in this discussion of energy trilemma of competition, sustainability, and security of supplies. So key literature around uh, this, this subject is there was not enough money in the energy market because of the price cap which have been put. And secondly, also um, dispatchable resources. They started exiting once large combustion price, uh, pr uh, plant directive was introduced by uh, European Commission and uh, all the power uh, projects which were based on high emission uh, uh, rates have to be kind of uh, gradually retired by 2020 or latest by 2025. Um, but the problem of uh, with, with new and renewable energy sources is that they might be intermittent if they are not combined with other technologies. And also the last problem uh, which was related to um, uh, introduction of um, uh, a capacity mechanism was to kind of address the issue related to the growth of peak demand in OECD countries, which was highly priced in, in elastic uh, and, and, and also income in elastic. So what it led to the price increase, uh, sorry, the demand for, uh, of, of, of peak, uh, sorry, the peak demand increased at a higher rate compared to general demand growth rate. So these issues had to be addressed and capacity mechanism was introduced to address these, uh, these issues. So first objective of capacity mechanism, which I thought would be to kind of buy uh, reliable dispatchable resources. The second one was to buy demand side resources so as to increase the elasticity in consumption. And if there is any capacity contribution from the renewable generators, uh, we should recognize that. And fourthly, to introduce effective governance to meet one, two, and three. I'm not focusing on objective four in this research. Uh, my, my, my research revolves around one, two, three, and I will try to address this issue uh, by this method of comparative analysis. So all the four objectives where uh, I looked into this, there are limited literature present uh, currently which compare all these four objectives. And, 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 and since the reforms are very new, there are a limited number of data available to do kind of econometric analysis. We can do definitely simulation studies, but it, uh, simulations are still based on some kind of principles. So therefore I thought that uh, let's compare the lesson learned from USA in six system operator reason of USA and then 12 system operator reason in, 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 in Europe to see what the policymakers are thinking, how they are going to design the systems. Uh, so uh, there are five types of capa capacity mechanism that have been introduced. One is capacity auction, where a uh, system operator conducts the uh, either weekly or monthly or, or yearly auction and they purchase capacities. And then capacity obligation is, is, is um, in, introduced, uh, is the second type, which was uh, obligations are introduced in load, load serving entities and load service uh, serving entities are required to procure capacities to meet the uh, sub, uh, demand in their areas. Up. Last one is capacity payment. Um, je voulais te faire un petit point sur uh, la session uh, de travail là, du groupe évaluation. Uh, uh, capacity, thank you so much. Uh, capacity payments. Uh, which is maybe administratively determined or regulatorily determined. And the uh, fourth one is reliability option, which was introduced in Italy and Northern Ireland, where it is kind of, they are given option payment to be present in energy market. And the last one is strategic reserve, which has been procured in Sweden, Finland, Germany, Greece. So I'm trying to uh, divide the rest of the presentation around these key five points. What are the principle of capacity market design? What are the contribution from generating resources, demand side resources, intermittent resources, and how the how do these two important um, um, uh, um, capacity mechanism reliability option compare with uh, capacity auction? So design principles. I have divided the design principle in four more main points. How does the demand curve look like? 
what is the capacity price discovery mechanism? Uh, what are the minimum bid size that we invite in the bidding? And the last one, what is the forward auction uh, uh, length and the length of the contract and the implication of it? So if we see the demand curve for capacity auction, we will notice that it has a specific shape of, of downward sloping uh, from B, C, D. Uh, uh, the x-axis represents the capacity uh, uh, over and above the derated capacity of 100% of, 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 of target capacity that we want to uh, uh, per, uh, have in the system at any particular point of time. And y-axis represents the cost of the capacity. So point A is 0% above 100% target capacity. Uh, point B is uh, a, a capacity which is just below uh, 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 ta uh, below the low value, the co capacity corresponding to loss of load expectation. What is this word loss of load expectation? So loss of load expectation is basically number of hours in a year where, where, where the uh, supplies will not be able to serve the demand in the system. So in, in, in most of the uh, um, uh, system operator region in USA, it is one day in 10 years, in, in, in European countries, it, it's roughly around three to eight hours in a year, which corresponds to equivalent amount. And point C is, is a point where capacity uh, uh, is equivalent to low uh, target and point D as, as, as Ilun also presented that when, when, uh, uh, when we have gone past the low values, the capacity price is actually reduced to zero. Uh, what we have seen uh, in, in the last slide is basically the elasticity of, of, of the capacity curve between B, C, D determines what, what, what the capacity prices will look like uh, um, in, in terms of their variance. So uh, we observe this uh, uh, kind of um, downward sloping curve in almost all markets, but um, the vertical curves are observed in all this market which I have listed on the left hand side and the horizontal curve is uh, observed in Spain because the regulated capacity payments are being made there. Uh, what is the implication? I want us to focus on the last column and uh, two highlighted cells. We will see the downward king sloping curve results in coefficient of variation which is very less, which is good. But vertical demand curve results in coefficient of variation which is very, very high. So this is developed from last five years of data uh, 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 from these um, system operators. And so it clearly shows that there is highly volatile capacity price uh, between one auction to other auction in a region where the capacity demand curve is vertical. But at the same time, you see the horizontal capacity um, 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 scenario, the, the variability is almost zero. This is also not a very good situation. I will explain it to, to you in the further slides why I'm saying that. Um, and the price discovery mechanism, uh, there are five types of price discovery mechanisms, sealed bid, descending clock, bilateral trade, which is negotiation. Then um, price is linked to ancillary service market payment. And then one a last price mechanism is regulated tariff for capacity. Uh, both, I mean, sealed bid and descending clock method are good, uh, which has been applied in all capacity market and newly implemented capacity markets. But the bilateral trades uh, are, are basically where the capacity prices are negotiated between the two parties. But it has a chance that there might be some uh, de deficiency in during the actual, uh, what is a dispatch of the capacities that, that is usually filled by uh, a system operator procuring capacities as, as some kind of reserve, either operating reserve or network reserve. But uh, such kind of uh, uh, procurement might be inefficient. And we have seen that uh, FERC has actually rejected the tariff increment proposal in California I ISO and SPP where the such, such deficient uh, capacity payment were linked to administrative prices in lieu of, uh, they, they, they asked as, uh, Southwest Power Pool to kind of go and design a better capacity market rather than uh, give uh, administratively determined capacity. Where the last slide we saw that horizontal line where um, uh, coefficient of variation is almost zero. 
it, it, we observe the average and Johnson effect. What, what does average Johnson effect means that you, you will have a significant rise in capacities, which is beyond what you efficiently need to serve the Lord. Uh, so in, in Spain, we observed that there are 2.5 times uh, of, of the total peak load capacities which have been installed there and each one of getting their uh, their um, capacity payments from 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 the consumers, uh, which is also not a good thing. Uh, what uh, now moving to the third point, um, what is the minimum bid size? Why this is important? Minimum bid size actually is important in the sense that uh, it in, if the bid size is small, it introduces competition in the market. If uh, uh, the minimum bid size is small, uh, bigger, then it might hinder some kind of capacity. Specifically, it will hinder uh, participation from demand side responses, which are relatively small, or storage, storage resources, which are also uh, could be very small, but now the grid scale uh, storage resources are also coming, but it, it kind of presents a barrier to entry. And that is what exactly we, we saw uh, in the uh, European Court of Justice ruling, which is the third point on, on the right hand side where Tempest Energy said that demand side resources are discouraged to participate in UK and, and that led, uh, it had a real implication that UK government had to suspend the capacity market for entire one and a half years. So they have resumed now uh, uh, the capacity market. So uh, this, this case of discrimination might come into uh, question whether demand side resources are treated on equal footing with the generating resources. And, and also uh, it is very, very important that, you know, when we have uh, uh, capacity uh, sizes is small, it kind of encourages the, the, the residential consumers also to come into market and supply the capacity. And the last element, which I want us to look into the forward auction map uh, and, 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 and contract length. So the sec, uh, third column, which is forward main auction basically indicates that how many months prior or how many years prior to the first delivery of the capacity the auction is conducted. So we will see that M minus uh, one to M minus six, it means that it, it is conducted one month before the capacity requirement is done. And there are some terms which is Y minus one, Y minus three, or uh, Y minus uh, four, they represent how many years before the first capacity is delivered. And, and, and uh, we will see that it, it varies a lot from one market to another, but in USA, it is usually in monthly terms. In European market, it's in the yearly term. The length of the contract of the capacity is also variable in, in both the markets. We see there are very, very long contracts in European market, which is of about 15 years uh, in length, and there are in, 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 but also in European market, there are a length of one year as well. So I will move to the next slide. So why does the length of contract actually come into picture? If, if there is a forward auction, the literature shows that there is a less volatility and the price risk reduces. And it means that suppliers could enter into the market, a uh, less volatile market, and, and they will be happy to participate in the less risky market. If there is a forward market already available because they know that what kind of revenue they are going to get from the market. Also, the length of the contract, if the contract length is sufficiently long, it hinders uh, gaming of, of during the bidding time. There is no incentive or less incentives to game the system when there is a sufficiently long contract is uh, awarded. So we see that there was a differential um, contract award, again, the point two on the right hand side, you will see that uh, demand side resources are awarded lesser length contract if we see uh, it was roughly around four years in uh, UK, but it has now been changed um, and, and compared to CCGT, which are given 15 years of contract. So that, that was also a discriminatory behavior. And that was also a ruling of European Court of Justice that no, you, you have to bring them together in the same footing so that DSR are not discriminated against uh, CCGT. And I, I believe sincerely also that um, it is better to have an equal amount of contract length in both cases. Now I will move to the generating resources. I know that I have only five minutes of time left with me and um, 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 and, 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 and try to cover my slides quickly. You Just can take a bit more time if you wish. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much. So, um, 
when we see that um, in generating resources, um, there are two questions that emerge. Should only the new generation be paid um, 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 higher, uh, allowed to bid in the market, or the old uh, plants could also be refurbished and brought in into the capacity market? That's the one question. The second question: What should be the length of the contract that they should be awarded? So um, again, um, the analysis shows that if we award a differential length of contract, it distorts the market outcome, efficient market outcome. And similarly, one has to implement price tracker threshold for the old, old generating resources because they probably would have recovered their capacity cost. But determining this uh, price taker threshold administratively could be a challenge because regulators may or may not approve this kind of, uh, of, of price taker threshold. And in, 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 in US market, we have seen there are several litigation related to this price taker th threshold as well. And there was um, uh, building on that, apart from price, uh, price taker threshold, there are price floors which have been implemented. Price floors have been implemented to kind of uh, 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 buy, to reduce the buyer market power or, or, or not allowing the generation which have already been subsidized to come into the market because they will kind of capture the supply market. So uh, these, these rules actually play uh, a significant role in, in kind of um, market design. And, and both PTTR and uh, MOPR does not go well with the regulators. They ask a rational for it because it also kind of discourages the competition. Um, moving to the de 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 demand side, uh, uh, firstly, I looked into should the demand side um, uh, be centrally uh, procured or it could be decentralized as well. I see that all, uh, all, all system operator reasons are well placed in terms of demand side procurement, all allow the procurement of demand side resources. Uh, the only thing that I, I would have to mention on the left hand side is that some market, they link the demand uh, uh, remuneration to the demand side resources to ancillary market. In some, uh, some, um, some market, they link to the administratively determined prices. But I believe that it should always be linked to either market determined prices, which is ancillary service prices, which are effective, uh, uh, and, that, and, and then also uh, into auction prices, which are also effective because it's determined by the market. In the decentralized um, um, market, I have seen there are some challenges. Uh, one of the challenges which I observed was in Mid East ISO, where um, in decentralized market, the load serving entity procured uh, the demand side, but during the emergency event, when system operator needed that capacity from load serving entity, those demand side resources or, or behind the meter generation, they were not present. So there was some a systematic issue there which needs to be removed to improve this interaction. But I feel that um, um, whatever the barriers which are uh, uh, present for demand side resources to participate has to be removed so as to make available uh, more capacities so as the system is not stressed um, during the peak demand time. Um, one of the second issue which we've uh, also looked into, uh, which I looked into it was, how should the residential demand side resources be encouraged to participate into the more, more, um, capacity market? And, and, and the second one was, what is the implication of the real-time pricing? So uh, one of the studies which I looked into specifically, it, it was um, a study conducted by Silva and Muhammad, which says that there was 43 megawatt of load saving from 1 million residential consumers, which roughly translates to 43 kilowatt, 43 kilowatt. So we need to have, a, which means which means that we need to have de minimis size or the minimum side participating in the capacity market, which are below 100, uh, 100 kilowatt which is if effectively not seen in any of the European market currently, uh, 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 which is really sad. And I think that we, we could do better in, in there. And in implementation of a smart meter, 
A smart meter, when I say that it, it, it has a both way of communication, what is telemetry and metering, which means that if I as a consumer want to kind of, uh, I mean, uh, available to supply capacity, I should be able to do it at my own initiative, which is not currently uh, present in all markets. Only two markets are, are, are fully present. Oh, sorry, two or three, four markets, sorry, 100%. Finland, Italy, Spain, and Sweden, and the rest other market are trying to reach there. And the dynamic prices also kind of ensures that um, uh, the, the capacity providers are encouraged to participate in the market. And dynamic pricing also, I see that it's not present in many of the markets, uh, which we can do better there as well. Uh, intermittent resources, um, the Capacity recognition from intermittent resources is a very big subject because we do not have significant researches where, where, where uh, we have noted the capacity contribution based on the regression analysis from, from um, uh, intermittent resources. But there are some ongoing resources. One of my colleagues at the University of Dundee is conducting that research and um, along, uh, along with my own supervisor, Sean. And, and it says that there's a promising results that during the peak time, intermittent resources from offshore wind are, are kind of, they, they are correlated. So offshore wind is higher when the peak demand is also higher. So that could be a promising sign. So we need to kind of conduct this research uh, 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 by doing a time series analysis for each uh, what is settlement period of, of, of the energy market and see whether uh, in a long term or a short term market, um, in, a, in a long term could wind be treated as a, a capacity resources on those specific intervals, if not throughout the day. So uh, what my own research says that, I mean, one of the papers which we'll be presenting on Wednesday is that, what is the implication of uh, uh, in introducing uh, wind into the system? When we introduce wind into the system, there are two things come into place, merit order effect, and secondly, uh, the, uh, the, the, the intermittency effect. So intermittency impact is usually kind of balanced in the balancing market. So what I've noticed that uh, uh, there is uh, every one terawatt of supply of wind in UK results in increase in one pound per megawatt hour procurement on monthly average price prices of balancing services. So uh, I, I assume that, you know, uh, levelized cost of um, wind, um, in a long term basis is roughly around 50 to 60 pounds and uh, and 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 if there is just one pound increment for every terawatt hour i believe that till we reach hit in uk 50 to 60 gigawatt hour of supply the wind still has a, a, a kind of promise to kind of reduce the prices in the long term and I did a back of envelope calculation for reliability option. Okay, just a second. Yeah, reliability option and, and, and capacity auction. And there I tried to calculate based on some realistic data, which of these two uh, reliability option capacity auction is more efficient. So I assumed the T uh, minus four auction data from UK uh, capacity bidding round, which is 8.4 kilowatt hour per year. And then um, retail price, I assume that thousand pounds uh, during the stress event. And if, 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 if the capacity providers are not able to provide capacity during those hours, the alternative arrangement will cost 1500 pounds. And I've assumed from Northern Ireland example, 500 pound of, of a strike price and, um, and penalty rate if they are not able to uh, pre, um, serve the load. Uh, serve the capacity uh, when when the notice is given by by the system operator to be present. Uh, One fifty percent in, in Northern Ireland, hundred percent in 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 GB market. And with this, what I have sorry, come to conclusion that um, there are five scenarios which we could look into. When capacity um, energy is procured only from energy market, the load is served. I mean, there is no significant amount of uh, difficulties there, but. When there is a scarcity, uh, there is no scarcity and capacity providers are present in the market. Also, there is no difficulties. When there is a scarcity and system operator gives a notice and both uh, in reliability option, which is, which is in the red color and the green color is, is for the capacity option. If they are present, uh, the reliability option is cheaper in all the cases. 
if there is a scarcity event and uh, system operator does not give notice, you will see that capacity prices jumps very, very high and, and, and uh, cost in case of reliability option still remains low. And same is the case when a system operator gives reasons and none of the capacity operators are participating. Uh, so this is the cost of the consumers. And this is exactly what the cost is going to be incurred by the capacity uh, provider. What is their marginal cost? So you will see that uh, if, if reliability options are not present to supply their uh, capacities, a reliability option has a liability, but capacity option do not have liabilities there. This is just a back of an envelope calculation. This is based on just simple calculations. And um, I believe that reliability option would be a good capacity mechanism to look forward to uh, in, in, in newer form of reforms than capacity options. So in conclusion, uh, the market design in the absence of data must be driven by principles. That's first point. The second point is we need to look into the instances of instantiation where regulators have kind of asked for revisions of the market design based on the principles. Those principles could be a guiding uh, a light for the capacity market design. And we also need to see where uh, we could get uh, more supplies from demand side resources and intermittent resources. Limitations, this, uh, this is based on public data. And uh, yes, when regression data is, uh, sorry, when sufficient data is available, we could actually uh, do a regression based analysis. Thank you so much for listening. That's great. Thank you very much, Dilip, for this nice presentation. Uh, as you see, um, security is very, very important, and uh, many factors affect security. So the design um, of the um, capacity mechanism um, may have an effect uh, on uh, security. And Dilip analyzed many situations, and uh, the study was really informative. We had a lot of information about the U.S. markets, the European markets. Uh, this comparative study is very important, and we do need uh, uh, more comparative studies. As you mentioned, uh, as data became available, then probably econometric um, uh, analysis will accompany what you have done, and uh, this is uh, a very important step towards uh, an in-depth uh, uh, analysis of the capacity mechanisms. Um, so we get uh, now to the questions. So I try to see whether there are any people that are raising their hands. Uh, no, I don't see any uh, raised hands. Um, uh, as I mentioned, you can probably ask the questions directly or through the chat. Um, do do we have, okay? Yulum has a question. Hi. Yeah, Yulum. Yeah. Hi, David. Thank you for your presentation. It's uh, it's really comprehensive uh, review of all the practical capacity market. I, I was trying to look into all the existing market. It's really exhausting to get all the details from every market. I mean, every market has a different design to adapt to the local context. And uh, it's like keep changing and changing from years to year. They're adjusting a little bit and a little bit. So it's really a, a big, a big uh, work for, for investigate all the things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am particularly interested in the, in the demand side to count the demand side into the capacity market. So uh, I, I tried to to model the demand side in the capacity market, but uh, it doesn't work very well, at least for me. So uh, I, I was wondering when when you are uh, looking for all the all the all the existing capacity design, and uh, when when you were thinking about the demand side, what is the image of the demand side? Is is it more like a, a single user, or it's more like a group of user, or let's say maybe a big retailer? To, to attend into the market. So if it's a big retailer, does it uh, lead to anything related to the, to the, let's say, the single users, the normal people who are actually pay the bills? Mm. Thank you so much for, uh, for your question. That is a very good question. Demands, I mean, let me start saying that demand side resources, uh, 
I mean, there are studies which have been conducted already how to kind of um, um, study them. Uh, one of the studies which I included in my presentation was from Mohammed and Silva, which, which I showed that there was a, a consumer base of 1 million and they were able to reduce a demand of 40 megawatt. So that is based on the real time data. Uh, uh, and and they, they saw that this reduction actually has two implications. Firstly, it reduces the generation capacity needs and also the demand curve moves uh, towards, I mean, inside. It means that, I mean, there's two important impacts. Firstly, you don't have to supply additional uh, generation resources and also the demand comes down. It means that the, there, is a, there is a gain in the price as well. There is a price reduction. So these two implications uh, does kind of um, uh, a kind of uh, encourage both, I will say, uh, residential consumers to be considered in the long term, either as aggregate, as you said, or aggregate. I mean, residential consumers could be maybe maybe two 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 kilowatt, uh, even a smaller sometime to ten kilowatt. But in this study, which, which Mohammed and Silva conducted, the residential consumers were having some kind of bigger capacities, roughly around 43 kilowatt. But as I see the designs across um, Europe and USA, what I noticed that in USA, the Federal Electricity Regulatory Commission, it is forcing the system operators to have uh, uh, de minimis, de minimis this, uh, the uh, with, for the demand side resources, which is minimum capacity resource less than 100 kilowatt, less than 100 kilowatt. So current, current standard is you must have uh, uh, a capacity which is lesser than 100 kilowatt. So regulators are acting uh, uh, system operator to implement uh, 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 system software updates, which dispatches a uh, uh, capacity lesser than 100 kilowatt in US market, but in Europe market, the, the least size which I've seen it was in France, which is 100 kilowatt. And the second second uh, size, the minimum size, which I've seen is, is, is after a long court battle where UK has to suspend its market for one complete year because demand side resources were discriminated. Uh, what is 500 kilowatt. So I will say that both um, residential consumers should be encouraged to participate in the capacity market and bigger consumers as well. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but, uh, but this is what best I could do at this time. It's it's very good answer. Thank you so much for, for the valuable data. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay. I hand it over to Anastasia. Sorry, I I was talking. <laughs> without unmuting my, uh, sorry for that. So I say thank you for uh, the exchange of ideas. And um, I was checking to see whether the, there are any other questions, but I don't see that. Uh, but some people prefer to exchange directly with the speakers in the chat room, and I encourage them to do so. Uh, now, I, uh, if there are no more questions, we have to <clears throat> end the session because we are, we are at the end of uh, the time. And uh, I would like to appreciate and to really thank a lot the speakers and the participants for the questions for making this session uh, really interesting. So thank you very much and hope you to see uh, you next time somewhere, probably uh, virtually or in um, reality. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank everybody. you so much. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Bye.
please before please. please before leaving uh, could the speakers uh, upload their presentations on the dashboard of the conference website please so we just uh, like upload that. your we can do it as well by the reaction with the hands up and the upload yeah thank you mm -hmm. so much thank you yeah okay good good <laughs> so bye. bye bye thanks a lot bye. thank you bye thank you so much thank you Alexi, you're still there? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I need your <clears throat> address, email, all this stuff in case that, because I offer some um, uh, 